Book 6, Part 2 of the Aeneid. The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro, translated by John Dryden. Book 6, The World Below, Part 2. Not far from thence the mournful fields appear, so called from lovers that inhabit there. The souls whom that unhappy flame invades, in secret solitude and myrtle shades, make endless moans and, pining with desire, lament too late their unextinguished fire. Here Procris, Eryphile, here he found, bearing her breast yet bleeding with the wound made by her son. He saw Pasiphae there, with Phaedra's ghost, a foul, incestuous pair. Their Laodamia with Evadne moves, unhappy both, both loyal in their loves. Caeneus, a woman once, and once a man, but ending in the sex she first began. Not far from those, Phoenician Dido stood, fresh from her wound, her bosom bathed in blood, whom when the Trojan hero hardly knew, obscure in shades and with a doubtful view, doubtful is he who sees through dusky night, or thinks he sees the moon's uncertain light. With tears he first approached the sullen shade, and as his love inspired him, thus he said, Unhappy queen, then is the common breath of rumor true in your reported death, and I, alas, the cause? By heaven I vow, and all the powers that rule the realms below, unwilling I forsook your friendly state, commanded by the gods and forced by fate, those gods, that fate whose unresisted might have sent me to these regions void of light, through the vast empire of eternal night. Nor dared I to presume that, pressed with grief, my flight should urge you to this dire relief. Stay, stay your steps, and listen to my vows. Tis the last interview that fate allows. In vain he thus attempts her mind to move, with tears and prayers and late repenting love. Disdainfully she looked, then turning round, but fixed her eyes unmoved upon the ground, and what he says and swears regards no more than the deaf rocks when the loud billows roar, but whirled away to shun his hateful sight, hid in the forest and the shades of night, then sought Sichaeus through the shady grove, who answered all her cares and equalled all her love. Some pious tears the pitying hero paid, and followed with his eyes the flitting shade, then took the forward way, by fate ordained, and with his guide the farther fields attained, where severed from the rest the warrior souls remained. Tydeus he met, with Miliagor's race, the pride of armies and the soldier's grace, and pale Adrastus with his ghastly face. Of Trojan chiefs he viewed a numerous train, all much lamented, all in battle slain, Glaucus and Miron high above the rest, and Tenor's sons, and Ceres' sacred priest, and proud Adeus, Priam's charioteer, who shakes his empty reins and aims his airy spear. The gladsome ghosts in circling troops attend, and with unwearied eyes behold their friend, delight to hover near and long to know what business brought him to the realms below. But Argive chiefs and Agamemnon's train, when his refulgent arms flashed through the shady plain, fled from his well-known face with wanted fear, as when his thundering sword and pointed spear drove headlong to their ships and gleaned the routed rear. They raised a feeble cry with trembling notes, but the weak voice deceived their gasping throats. Here Priam's son Diophobus he found, whose face and limbs were one continued wound. Dishonest, with lopped arm the youth appears, spoiled of his nose and shortened of his ears. He scarcely knew him, striving to disown his blotted form and blushing to be known, and therefore first began, O Teucer's race, who durst thy faultless figure thus deface? What heart could wish, what hand inflict this dire disgrace? T'was famed that in our last and fatal night your single prowess long sustained the fight. Till tired, not forced, a glorious fate you chose, and fell upon a heap of slaughtered foes. But in remembrance of so brave a deed, a tomb and funeral honors I decreed, thrice called your manes on the Trojan plains, the place your armor and your name retains. Your body, too, I sought, and had I found, designed for burial in your native ground. The ghost replied, Your piety has paid all needful rites to rest my wandering shade. 
but cruel fate and my more cruel wife to grecian swords betrayed my sleeping life these are the monuments of helen's love the shame i bear below the marks i bore above you know in what deluding joys we passed the night that was by heaven decreed our last for when the fatal horse descending down pregnant with arms o'erwhelmed the unhappy town she feigned nocturnal orgies left my bed and mixed with trojan dames the dances led then waving high her torch the signal made which roused the grecians from their ambuscade with watching overworn with cares oppressed unhappy i had lain me down to rest and heavy sleep my weary limbs possessed meantime my worthy wife our arms mislaid and from beneath my head my sword conveyed the door unlatched and with repeated calls invites her former lord within my walls thus in her crime her confidence she placed and with new treason would redeem the past what need i more into the room they ran and meanly murdered a defenceless man ulysses basely born first led the way avenging powers with justice if i pray that fortune be their own another day but answer you and in your turn relate what brought you living to the stygian state driven by the winds and errors of the sea or did you heaven's superior doom obey or tell what other chance conducts your way to view with mortal eyes our dark retreats tumults and torments of the infernal seats while thus in talk the flying hours they pass the sun had finished more than half his race and they perhaps in words and tears has spent the little time of stay which heaven had lent but thus the sibyl chides their long delay night rushes down and headlong drives the day tis here in different paths the way divides the right to pluto's golden palace guides the left to that unhappy region tends which to the depth of tartarus descends the seat of night profound and punished fiends then thus deiphobus o sacred maid forbear to chide and be your will obeyed lo to the secret shadows i retire to pay my penance till my years expire proceed auspicious prince with glory crowned and born to better fates than i have found he said and while he said his steps he turned to secret shadows and in silence mourned the hero looking on the left espied a lofty tower and strong on every side with treble walls which phlegathon surrounds whose fiery flood the burning empire bounds and pressed betwixt the rocks the bellowing noise resounds wide is the fronting gate and raised on high with adamantine columns threats the sky vain is the force of man and heavens as vain to crush the pillars which the pile sustain sublime on these a tower of steel is reared and dire tisiphone there keeps the ward girt in her sanguine gown by night and day observant of the souls that pass the downward way from thence are heard the groans of ghosts the pains of sounding lashes and of dragging chains the trojan stood astonished at their cries and asked his guide from whence those yells arise and what the crimes and what the tortures were and loud laments that rent the liquid air she thus replied the chaste and holy race are all forbidden this polluted place but hecate when she gave to rule the woods then led me trembling through these dire abodes and taught the tortures of the avenging gods these are the realms of unrelenting fate and awful Rhadamanthus rules the state. He hears and judges each committed crime, inquires into the matter, place, and time. The conscious wretch must all his acts reveal, loath to confess, unable to conceal, from the first moment of his vital breath to his last hour of unrepenting death. Straight o'er the guilty ghost the fury shakes, the sounding whip and brandishes her snakes, and the pale sinner with her sisters takes then of itself unfolds the eternal door with dreadful sounds the brazen hinges roar you see before the gate what stalking ghost commands the guard what sentries keep the post more formidable hydra stands within whose jaws with iron teeth severely grin the gaping gulf low to the centre lies and twice as deep as earth is distant from the skies the rivals of the gods the titan race here singed with lightning roll within the unfathomed space here lie the alien twins i saw them both enormous bodies of gigantic growth 
who dared in fight the thunderer to defy, affect his heaven and force him from the sky. Salmonius suffering cruel pains I found, for emulating Jove the rattling sound of mimic thunder and the glittering blaze of pointed lightnings and their forky rays. Through Elis and the Grecian towns he flew, the audacious wretch four fiery courses drew. He waved a torch aloft, and madly vain, sought godlike worship from a servile train. Ambitious fool, with horny hooves to pass, or hollow arches of resounding brass, to rival thunder in its rapid course, and imitate inimitable force. But he, the king of heaven, obscure on high, bared his red arm, and launching from the sky his writhen bolt, not shaking empty smoke, down to the deep abyss the flaming felon struck. There Titius was to see, who took his birth from heaven, his nursing from the foodful earth. Here his gigantic limbs, with large embrace, enfold nine acres of infernal space. A ravenous vulture, in his opened side, her crooked beak and cruel talons tried, still for the growing liver digged his breast. The growing liver still supplied the feast. Still are his entrails fruitful to their pains. The immortal hunger lasts, the immortal food remains. Ixion and Perithus I could name, and more Thessalian chiefs of mighty fame. High o'er their heads a mouldering rock is placed, that promises a fall and shakes at every blast. They lie below, on golden beds displayed, and genial feasts with regal pomp are made. The queen of furies by their sides is set, and snatches from their mouths the untasted meat, which, if they touch, her hissing snake she rears, tossing her torch and thundering in their ears. Then they, who brothers better claim disowned, expel their parents and usurp the throne, defraud their clients, and to lucre sold, sit brooding on unprofitable gold, who dare not give, and even refuse to lend, to their poor kindred, or a wanting friend. Vast is the throng of these, nor less the train, of lustful youths for foul adultery slain, hosts of deserters who their honour sold, and basely broke their faith for bribes of gold. All these within the dungeon's depth remain, despairing pardon and expecting pain. Ask not what pains, nor further seek to know their process or the forms of law below. Some roll the weighty stone, some laid along and bound with burning wires on spokes of wheels are hung. Unhappy Theseus, doomed for ever there, is fixed by fate on his eternal chair, and wretched Phlegius warns the world with cries, could warning make the world more just or wise? Learn righteousness, and dread the avenging deities. To tyrants others have their country sold, imposing foreign lords for foreign gold. Some have old laws repealed, new statutes made, not as the people pleased, but as they paid. With incest some their daughters' beds profaned, all dared the worst of ills, and what they dared attained. Had I a hundred mouths, a hundred tongues, and throats of brass inspired with iron lungs, I could not half those horrid crimes repeat, nor half the punishments those crimes have met. But let us taste our voyage to pursue. The walls of Pluto's palace are in view. The gate and iron arch above it stands, on anvils labored by the cyclops' hands. Before our farther way the fates allow, here must we fix on high the golden bow. She said, and through the gloomy shades they passed, and choose the middle path. Arrived at last, the prince with living water sprinkled o'er his limbs and body, then approached the door, possessed the porch, and on the front above he fixed the fatal bow required by Pluto's love. These holy rites performed, they took their way where long extended plains of pleasure lay, the verdant fields with those of heaven may vie, with ether vested and a purple sky, the blissful seats of happy souls below. Stars of their own, and their own suns they know, their airy limbs in sports they exercise, and on the green contend the wrestler's prize. Some in heroic verse divinely sing, others in artful measures led the ring. The Thracian bard, surrounded by the rest, there stands conspicuous in his flowing vest, his flying fingers and harmonious quill strike seven distinguished notes, and seven at once they fill. Here found they Teucer's old heroic race, born better times and happier years to grace. 
Aceracus and Ilus here enjoy perpetual fame with him who founded Troy. The chief beheld their chariots from afar, their shining arms and coursers trained to war, their lances fixed in earth, their steeds around, free from their harness, graze the flowery ground. The love of horses which they had alive, and care of chariots, after death, survive. Some cheerful souls were feasting on the plain, some did the song, and some the choir maintain, beneath a laurel shade, where mighty Po mounts up to woods above, and hides his head below. Here patriots live, who for their country's good, in fighting fields were prodigal of blood. Priests of unblemished lives here make abode, and poets worthy their inspiring God, and searching wits of more mechanic parts, who graced their age with new invented arts, those who to worth their bounty did extend, and those who knew that bounty to commend. The heads of these with holy fillets bound, and all their temples were with garlands crowned. To these the sibyl thus her speech addressed, and first to him surrounded by the rest, towering his height, and ample was his breast. Say, happy souls, divine Musaeus, say, where lives Anchises, and where lies our way, to find the hero, for whose only sake we sought the dark abodes, and crossed the bitter lake. To this the sacred poet thus replied, In no fixed place the happy souls reside, in groves we live, and lie on mossy beds, by crystal streams that murmur through the meads, but pass yon easy hill, and thence descend, the path conducts you to your journey's end. This said, he led them up the mountain's brow, and shows them all the shining fields below. They wind the hill, and through the blissful meadows go. But old Anchises, in a flowery vale, reviewed his mustered race, and took the tale, those happy spirits which, ordained by fate, for future beings and new bodies wait, with studious thought observed the lustrous throng, in nature's order as they passed along, their names, their fates, their conduct, and their care, in peaceful senates and successful war. He, when Aeneas on the plain appears, meets him with open arms and falling tears. Welcome, he said, the gods' undoubted race, O long expected to my dear embrace, once more tis given me to behold your face, once more tis given me to behold your face. The love and pious duty which you pay have passed the perils of so hard a way. Tis true, computing times I now believed, the happy day approached, nor are my hopes deceived. What length of lands, what oceans have you passed, what storms sustained, and on what shores been cast? How have I feared your fate, but feared it most, when love assailed you on the Libyan coast? To this the filial duty thus replies, your sacred ghost before my sleeping eyes appeared, and often urged this painful enterprise. After long tossing on the Tyrene sea, my navy rides at anchor in the bay. But reach your hand, O parent shade, the dear embraces of your longing son, he said, and falling tears his face bedew. Then thrice around his neck his arms he threw, and thrice the flitting shadow slipped away, like winds or empty dreams that fly the day. Now in a secret vale the Trojan sees a separate grove through which a gentle breeze plays with a passing breath and whispers through the trees, and just before the confines of the wood the gliding Lethe leads her silent flood. About the boughs an airy nation flew, thick as the humming bees that hunt the golden dew, in summer's heat on tops of lilies feed, and creep within their bells to suck the balmy seed. The winged army roams the fields around, the rivers and the rocks remurmur to the sound. Aeneas, wondering, stood, then asked the cause which to the stream the crowding people draws. Then thus the sire, The souls that throng the flood are those to whom by fate are other bodies owed. In Lethe's lake they long oblivion taste, of future life secure, forgetful of the past. Long has my soul desired this time and place, to set before your sight your glorious race, that this presaging joy may fire your mind, to seek the shores by destiny designed. O oh, Father, can it be that souls sublime return to visit our terrestrial clime, and that the generous mind, released by death, can covet lazy limbs and mortal breath? 
Anchises then in order thus began to clear those wonders to his godlike son. Know first that heaven and earth's compacted frame, and flowing waters and the starry flame, and both the radiant lights, one common soul, inspires and feeds and animates the whole. This active mind, infused through all the space, unites and mingles with the mighty mass. Hence men and beasts the breath of life obtain, and birds of air, and monsters of the main. The ethereal vigor is in all the same, and every soul is filled with equal flame, as much as earthy limbs and gross allay of mortal members subject to decay, blunt not the beams of heaven and edge of day. From this coarse mixture of terrestrial parts, desire and fear by turns possess their hearts, and grief and joy, nor can the groveling mind, in the dark dungeon of the limbs confined, assert the native skies, or own its heavenly kind. Nor death itself can wholly wash their stains, but long contracted filth even in the soul remains. The relics of inveterate vice they wear, and spots of sin obscene in every face appear. For this are varied penances enjoined, and some are hung to bleach upon the wind, some plunged in waters, others purged in fires, till all the dregs are drained, and all the rust expires. All have their manes, and those manes bare, the few so cleansed to these abodes repair, and breathe in ample fields the soft Elysian air. Then are they happy, when by length of time the scurf is worn away of each committed crime, no speck is left of their habitual stains, but the pure ether of the soul remains. But when a thousand rolling years are past, so long their punishments and penance last, whole droves of minds are, by the driving god, compelled to drink the deep Lithian flood, in large forgetful draughts to steep the cares of their past labors and their irksome years, that unremembering of its former pain, the soul may suffer mortal flesh again. Thus having said, the father's spirit leads the priestess and his son through swarms of shades, and takes a rising ground from thence to see the long procession of his progeny. Survey, pursued the sire, this airy throng, as offered to thy view they pass along. These are the Italian names which fate will join with ours and graph upon the Trojan line. Observe the youth who first appears in sight, and holds the nearest station to the light, already seems to snuff the vital air, and leans just forward on a shining spear. Silvius is he, thy last begotten race, but first in order sent to fill thy place. An Alban name, but mixed with Dardan blood, born in the covert of a shady wood. Him, fair Lavinia, thy surviving wife, shall breed in groves to lead a solitary life. In Alba shall he fix his royal seat, and born a king a race of kings beget. Then Procus, honor of the Trojan name, Capus and Numitor of endless fame. A second Silvius after these appears, Silvius Aeneas, for thy name he bears, For arms and justice equally renowned, Who late restored in Alba shall be crowned. How great they look, how vigorously they wield Their weighty lances and sustain the shield. But they, who crowned with oaken wreaths appear, Shall Gabian walls and strong Fidena rear, Nomentum, Bola, with Pomicia found, And raise Collation's towers on rocky ground. All these shall then be towns of mighty fame, Though now they lie obscure, and lands without a name. See Romulus the Great, born to restore The crown that once his injured grandsire wore. This prince, a priestess of your blood, shall bear, And like his sire in arms he shall appear. Two rising crests his royal head adorn, Born from a god, himself to god had borne, His sire already signs him for the skies, And marks the seat amidst the deities. Auspicious chief, thy race in times to come Shall spread the conquests of imperial Rome, Rome, whose ascending towers shall heaven invade, Involving earth and ocean in her shade, High as the mother of the gods in place, And proud, like her, of an immortal race. Then when in pomp she makes the Phrygian round, with golden turrets on her temples crowned, a hundred gods her sweeping train supply, her offspring all, and all command the sky. Now fix your sight, and stand intent to see your Roman race and Julian progeny. 
the mighty caesar waits his vital hour impatient for the world and grasps his promised power but next behold the youth of form divine caesar himself exalted in his line augustus promised oft and long foretold sent to the realm that saturn ruled of old born to restore a better age of gold Africa and india shall his powers obey he shall extend his propagated sway beyond the solar year without the starry way where atlas turns the rolling heavens around and his broad shoulders with their lights are crowned at his foreseen approach already quake the caspian kingdoms and maeotian lake their seers behold the tempest from afar and threatening oracles denounce the war nile hears him knocking at his sevenfold gates and seeks his hidden spring and fears his nephew's fates nor hercules more lands or labors knew not though the brazen-footed hind he slew freed erymanthus from the foaming boar and dipped his arrows in laernian gore nor bacchus turning from his indian war by tigers drawn triumphant in his car from nice's top descending on the plains with curling vines around his purple reins and doubt we yet through dangers to pursue the paths of honour and a crown in view but what's the man who from afar appears his head with olive crowned his hand a censer bears his hoary beard and holy vestments bring his lost idea back i know the roman king he shall to peaceful rome new laws ordain called from his mean abode a sceptre to sustain him tullus next in dignity succeeds an active prince and prone to martial deeds he shall his troops for fighting fields prepare disused to toils and triumphs of the war by dint of sword his crown he shall increase and scour his armor from the rust of peace whom ancus follows with a fawning air but vain within and proudly popular next view the tarquin kings the venging sword of brutus justly drawn and rome restored he first renews the rods and acts severe and gives the consuls royal robes to wear his sons who seek the tyrant to sustain and long for arbitrary lords again with ignominy scourged in open sight he dooms to death deserved asserting public right unhappy man to break the pious laws of nature pleading in his children's cause howe'er the doubtful fact is understood tis love of honour and his country's good the consul not the father sheds the blood behold tarquatus the same track pursue and next the two devoted decii view the drusian line camillus loaded home with standards well redeemed and foreign foes o'ercome the pair you see in equal armour shine now friends below in close embraces join but when they leave the shady realms of night and clothed in bodies breathe your upper light with mortal hate each other shall pursue what wars what wounds what slaughter shall ensue from alpine heights the father first descends his daughter's husband in the plain attends his daughter's husband arms his eastern friends embrace again my sons be foes no more nor stain your country with her children's gore and thou the first lay down thy lawless claim thou of my blood who bearest the julian name another comes who shall in triumph ride and to the capital his chariot guide from conquered corinth rich with grecian spoils and yet another famed for warlike toils on argos shall impose the roman laws and on the greeks revenge the trojan cause shall drag in chains their achillean race shall vindicate his ancestors disgrace and pallas for her violated place great cato there for gravity renowned and conquering cossus goes with laurels crowned who can omit the gracchi who declare the scipio's worth those thunderbolts of war the double bane of carthage who can see without esteem for virtuous poverty severe fabricius or can cease to admire the ploughman consul in his coarse attire tired as i am my praise the fabii claim and thou great hero greatest of thy name ordained in war to save the sinking state and by delays to put a stop to fate let others better mould the running mass of metals and inform the breathing brass and soften into flesh a marble face plead better at the bar describe the skies and when the stars descend and when they rise 
but rome tis thine alone with awful sway to rule mankind and make the world obey disposing peace and war by thine own majestic way to tame the proud the fettered slave to free these are imperial arts and worthy thee he paused and while with wondering eyes they viewed the passing spirits thus his speech renewed see great marcellus how untired in toils he moves with manly grace how rich with regal spoils he when his country threatened with alarms requires his courage and his conquering arms shall more than once the punic bands affright shall kill the gaulish king in single fight then to the capital and triumph move and the third spoil shall grace Feretrian Jove. Aeneas here beheld, of form divine, a godlike youth in glittering armor shine, with great Marcellus keeping equal pace, but gloomy were his eyes, dejected was his face. He saw, and, wondering, asked his airy guide, what and of whence was he, who pressed the hero's side? His son, or one of his illustrious name? How like the former, and almost the same! Observe the crowds that compass him around, All gaze and all admire and raise a shouting sound, But hovering mists around his brows are spread, And night with sable shades involves his head. Seek not to know, the ghost replied with tears, The sorrows of thy sons in future years. This youth, the blissful vision of a day, Shall just be shown on earth and snatched away. The gods too high had raised the Roman state, were but their gifts as permanent as great. What groans of men shall feel the Martian field? How fierce a blaze his flaming pile shall yield? What funeral pomp shall flowing Tiber see, when rising from his bed he views the sad solemnity? No youth shall equal hopes of glory give, no youth afford so great a cause to grieve. The Trojan honor and the Roman boast, admired when living and adored when lost, mirror of ancient faith in early youth, undaunted worth, inviolable truth. No foe unpunished in the fighting field shall dare thee, foot to foot, with sword and shield, much less in arms oppose thy matchless force, when thy sharp spurs shall urge thy foaming horse. Ah, couldst thou break through fate's severe decree, a new Marcellus shall arise in thee. Full canisters of fragrant lilies bring, mixed with the purple roses of the spring, let me with funeral flowers his body strow, this gift which parents to their children's owe, this unavailing gift at least I may bestow. Thus having said, he led the hero round the confines of the blessed Elysian ground, which when Anchises to his son had shown, and fired his mind to mount the promised throne, he tells the future wars ordained by fate, the strength and customs of the Latian state, the prince and people, and forearms his care, with rules to push his fortune or to bear. Two gates, the silent house of sleep, adorn, of polished ivory this, that of transparent horn, true visions through transparent horn arise, through polished ivory pass deluding lies, of various things discoursing as he passed, and Kaisis hither bends his steps at last. Then, through the gate of ivory, he dismissed his valiant offspring, and divining guest. Straight to the ships Aeneas's way embarked his men and skimmed along the sea, still coasting till he gained Kajita's bay. At length on oozy ground his galleys moor, their heads are turned to sea, their sterns to shore. End of Book Six Book Seven Part One of the Aeneid The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book 7 Juno Served by a Fury Part 1 And thou, O matron of immortal fame, here dying, to the shore hast left thy name. Kaijita still the place is called from thee, the nurse of great Aeneas' infancy. Here rest thy bones in rich Hesperia's plains, Thy name, tis all a ghost can have, remains. Now, when the prince her funeral rites had paid, He ploughed the Tyrene seas with sails displayed, 
From land a gentle breeze arose by night, Serenely shone the stars, the moon was bright, And the sea trembled with her silver light. Now near the shelves of Circe's shores they run, Circe the rich, the daughter of the sun. A dangerous coast, the goddess wastes her days In joyous songs, the rocks resound her lays. In spinning, o'er the loom she spends the night, And cedar brands supply her father's light. From hence were heard, rebellowing to the main, The roars of lions that refused the chain, The grunts of bristled boars, the groans of bears, And herds of howling wolves that stunned the sailors' ears. These from their caverns, at the close of night, Filled the sad isle with horror and affright. Darkling they mourned their fate, whom Circe's power, that watched the moon in planetary hour, with words and wicked herbs from humankind had altered, and in brutal shapes confined. Which monsters, lest the Trojans' pious host should bear, or touch upon the enchanted coast, propitious Neptune steered their course by night with rising gales that sped their happy flight. Supplied with these, they skim the sounding shore, And hear the swelling surges vainly roar. Now, when the rosy morn began to rise, And waved her saffron streamer through the skies, When Thetis blushed in purple not her own, And from her face the breathing winds were blown, A sudden silence sate upon the sea, And sweeping oars, with struggling, urged their way, the Trojan, from the main, beheld a wood, Which, thick with shades, and a brown horror stood. Betwixt the trees the Tiber took his course, With whirlpools dimpled, And with downward force that drove the sand along, He took his way, and rolled his yellow billows to the sea. About him, and above, and round the wood, The birds that haunt the borders of his flood, that bathed within or basked upon his side, To tuneful songs their narrow throats applied. The captain gives command, The joyful train glide through the gloomy shade, And leave the main. Now, Erato, thy poet's mind inspire, And fill his soul with thy celestial fire. Relate what Latium was, her ancient kings. Declare the past and state of things, when first the Trojan fleet Ausonia sought, and how the rivals loved, and how they fought. These are my theme, and how the war began, and how concluded by the godlike man. For I shall sing of battles, blood, and rage, which princes and their people did engage and haughty souls that, moved with mutual hate, in fighting fields pursued and found their fate, that roused the Tyrene realm with loud alarms, and peaceful Italy involved in arms. A larger scene of action is displayed, and, rising hence, a greater work is weighed. Latinus, old and mild, had long possessed the Latin scepter, and his people blessed. His father Faunus, a Laurentian dame, his mother, fair Marica, was her name. But Faunus came from Picus. Picus drew his birth from Saturn, if records be true. Thus King Latinus, in the third degree, had Saturn author of his family. But this old, peaceful prince, as heaven decreed, Was blessed with no male issue to succeed. His sons in blooming youth were snatched by fate. One only daughter heired the royal state. Fired with her love and with ambition led, The neighboring princes court her nuptial bed. Among the crowd, but far above the rest, Young Turnus, 
to the beauteous maid addressed. Turnus, for high descent and graceful mien, was first, and favored by the Latian queen. With him she strove to join Lavinia's hand, but dire portents the purposed match withstand. Deep in the palace, of long growth, there stood a laurel's trunk, a venerable wood, where rites divine were paid, whose holy hair was kept and cut with superstitious care. This plant Latinus, when his town he walled, then found, and from the tree Laurentum called. And last, in honor of his new abode, he vowed the laurel to the laurel's god. It happened once, a boding prodigy, a swarm of bees that cut the liquid sky, unknown from whence they took their airy flight, upon the topmost branch in clouds alight. There with their clasping feet together clung, and a long cluster from the laurel hung. An ancient augur, prophesied from hence, Behold on Latian shores a foreign prince, from the same parts of heaven his navy stands, to the same parts on earth his army lands. The town he conquers, and the tower commands. Yet more, when fair Lavinia fed the fire before the gods, and stood beside her sire, strange to relate, the flames, involved in smoke of incense from the sacred altar broke, caught her disheveled hair and rich attire, her crown and jewels crackled in the fire. From thence the fuming trail began to spread, and lambent glories danced about her head. This new portent the seer with wonder views, then, pausing, thus his prophecy renews. The nymph, who scatters flaming fires around, shall shine with honor, shall herself be crowned. But, caused by her irrevocable fate, War shall the country waste and change the state. Latinus, frighted with this dire ostent, for counsel to his father Faunus went, and sought the shades renowned for prophecy, which near Albunia's sulphurous fountain lie. To these the Latian and the Sabine land fly, when distressed, and thence relief demand. The priest on skins of offerings takes his ease, and nightly visions in his slumber sees. A swarm of thin, aerial shapes appears, and fluttering round his temples deafs his ears. These he consults, and the future fates to know, from powers above and from the fiends below. Here, for the gods' advice, Latinus flies, offering a hundred sheep for sacrifice. Their woolly fleeces, as the rites required, he laid beneath him, and to rest retired. No sooner were his eyes in slumber bound, when from above a more than mortal sound invades his ears, and thus the vision spoke. Seek not my seed in Latian bands to yoke our fair Lavinia, nor the gods provoke. A foreign sun upon thy shore descends, Whose martial fame from pole to pole extends. His race in arms and arts of peace renowned, Not Latium shall contain, nor Europe bound. Tis theirs, whate'er the sun surveys around. These answers, in the silent night received, the king himself divulged, the land believed. The fame through all the neighboring nations flew, when now the Trojan navy was in view. Beneath a shady tree the hero spread his table on the turf. With cakes of bread and with his chiefs on forest fruits he fed. They sate, and not without the gods' command. Their homely fare dispatched, the hungry band invade their trenchers next, and soon devour, to mend the scanty meal, their cakes of flour. Ascanius thus observed, and smiling said, 
See, we devour the plates on which we fed. The speech had omen that the Trojan race should find repose in this the time and place. Aeneas took the word and thus replies, confessing fate with wonder in his eyes. All hail, O earth! All hail, my household gods! Behold the destined place of your abodes, for thus Anchises prophesied of old, and this our fatal place of rest foretold. When, on a foreign shore, instead of meat, by famine forced, your trenchers shall you eat. Then ease your weary Trojans will attend, and the long labors of your voyage end. Remember, on that happy coast to build, and with a trench enclose the fruitful field. This was that famine, this the fatal place which ends the wandering of our exiled race. Then on tomorrow's dawn your care employ to search the land and where the cities lie and what the men but give this day to joy. Now pour to Jove, and after Jove is blessed, call great Anchises to the genial feast, crown high the goblets with a cheerful draught, enjoy the present hour, adjourn the future thought. Thus having said, the hero bound his brows, with leafy branches then performed his vows, adoring first the genius of the place, then earth the mother of the heavenly race. The nymphs and native godheads yet unknown in night, and all the stars that gild her sable throne, the ancient Cybele, and Idean Jove, and last his sire below, and mother queen above, then heaven's high monarch thundered thrice aloud, and thrice he shook aloft a golden cloud. Soon through the joyful camp a rumor flew, the time was come their city to renew. Then every brow with cheerful green is crowned, the feasts are doubled, and the bowls go round. When next the rosy morn disclosed the day, the scouts to several parts divide their way, to learn the natives' names, their towns explore, the coasts and trendings of the crooked shore. Here Tiber flows, and here Numicus stands. Here warlike Latins hold the happy lands. The pious chief, who sought by peaceful ways to found his empire, and his town to raise, a hundred youths from all his train selects, and to the Latian court their course directs. The spacious palace where their prince resides, and all their heads with wreaths of olive hides, they go commissioned to require peace, and carry presents to procure access. Thus, while they speed their pace, the prince designs his new elected seat, and draws the lines. The Trojans, round the place a rampire cast, and palisades about the trenches placed. Meantime the train, proceeding on their way, from the far the town and lofty towers survey, at length approach the walls. Without the gate they see the boys and Latian youth debate, the martial prizes on the dusty plain. Some drive the cars, and some the coursers rein. Some bend the stubborn bow for victory, and some with darts their active sinews try. A posting messenger, dispatched from hence, of this fair troop advised their aged prince, that foreign men of mighty stature came, uncouth their habit, and unknown their name, the king ordains their entrance, and ascends his regal seat, surrounded by his friends. A palace built by Picus, vast and proud, supported by a hundred pillars stood, and round encompassed with a rising wood. The pile o'erlooked the town and drew the sight, surprised at once with reverence and delight. There kings received the marks of sovereign power. In state the monarchs marched. The lictors bore their awful axes and the rods before. Here the tribunal stood, 
the house of prayer, and here the sacred senators repair. All at large tables, in long order set, a ram their offering, and a ram their meat. Above the portal, carved in cedar wood, placed in their ranks, their godlike grandsires stood. Old Saturn with his crooked scythe on high, and Idolus that led the colony, and ancient Janus with his double face and bunch of keys, the porter of the place. There good Sabinus, planter of the vines, on a short pruning hook his head reclines, and studiously surveys his generous wines. Then warlike kings, who for their country fought, and honorable wounds from battle brought. Around the posts hung helmets, darts, and spears, and captive chariots, axes, shields, and bars, and broken beaks of ships, the trophies of their wars. Above the rest, as chief of all the band, was Picus placed, a buckler in his hand, his other waved a long divining wand. Girt in his gaben gown the hero sate, yet could not with his art avoid his fate. For Circe long had loved the youth in vain, till love refused, converted to disdain. Then mixing powerful herbs with magic art, she changed his form, who could not change his heart. Constrained him in a bird, and made him fly with party-colored plumes, a chattering pie. In this high temple, on a chair of state, the seat of audience, old Latinus sate, and gave admission to the Trojan train, and thus with pleasing accents he began, Tell me, ye Trojans, for that name you own, nor is your course upon our coasts unknown. Say what you seek, and whither were you bound? Were you by stress of weather cast aground? Such dangers as on seas are often seen, and oft befall to miserable men. Or come, your shipping in our ports to lay, spent and disabled in so long a way. Say what you want, the Latians you shall find, not forced to goodness, but by will inclined. For since the time of Saturn's holy reign, his hospitable customs we retain. I call to mind, but time the tale has worn, the Arunki told that Dardanus, though born on Latian plains, yet sought the Phrygian shore, and Samothracia, Samos called before. From Tuscan Coritum he claimed his birth, but after, when exempt from mortal earth, from thence ascended to his kindred skies, a god, and, as a god, augments their sacrifice. He said, Ileonius made this reply, O king of Faunus' royal family, nor wintry winds to Latium forced our way, nor did the stars our wandering course betray. Willing we sought your shores, and hither bound the port so long desired at length we found. From our sweet homes and ancient realms expelled, great is the greatest that the sun beheld. The god began our line who rules above. And as our race our king descends from Jove, and hither are we come by his command to crave admission in your happy land. How dire a tempest from Mycenae poured our plains, our temples, and our town devoured! What was the waste of war? What fierce alarms shook Asia's crown with European arms? Even such have heard, if such there be, whose earth is bounded by the frozen sea, and such as, born beneath the burning sky and sultry sun, betwixt the tropics lie. From that dire deluge, through the watery waste, such length of years, such various perils past at last escaped, to Latium we repair, to beg what you without your want may spare. 
the common water, and the common air, sheds which ourselves will build, and mean abodes fit to receive and serve our banished gods. Nor our admission shall your realm disgrace, nor length of time our gratitude efface. Besides, what endless honor you shall gain to save and shelter Troy's unhappy train. Now by my sovereign and his fate I swear, renowned for faith in peace, for force in war. Oft our alliance other lands desired, and what we seek of you, of us required. Despite not then that in our hands we bear these holy boughs, sue with words of prayer. Fate and the gods by their supreme command have doomed our ships to seek the Latian land. To these abodes our fleet Apollo sends. Here Dardanus was born and hither tends, where Tuscan Tiber rolls with rapid force, and where Numicus opes his holy source. Besides, our prince presents, with his request, some small remains of what his sire possessed, this golden charger snatched from burning Troy, Anchises did in sacrifice employ. This royal robe and this tiara wore old Priam, and this golden scepter bore in full assemblies and in solemn games. These purple vests were weaved by Dardan dames. Thus, while he spoke, Latinus rolled around his eyes and fixed a while upon the ground, intent he seemed, and anxious in his breast, not by the scepter moved or kingly vest, but pondering future things of wondrous weight, succession, empire, and his daughter's fate. On these he mused within his thoughtful mind, and then revolved what Faunus had divined. This was the foreign prince, by fate decreed, to share his scepter and Lavinia's bed. This was the race that sure portents foreshew to sway the world in land and sea subdue. At length he raised his cheerful head and spoke. The powers, said he, the powers we both invoke to you and yours and mine propitious be and firm our purpose with their augury have what you ask. Your presence I receive. Land, where and when you please, with ample leave. Partake and use my kingdom as your own. All shall be yours while I command the crown. And if my wished alliance please your king, tell him he should not send the peace, but bring. Then let him not a friend's embraces fear. The peace is made when I behold him here. Besides this answer, tell my royal guest, I add to his commands my own request. One only daughter heirs my crown and state, whom not our oracles, nor heaven, nor fate, nor frequent prodigies permit to join with any native of the Ausonian line. A foreign son-in-law shall come from far, such is our doom, a chief renowned in war, whose race shall bear aloft the Latian name, and through the conquered world diffuse our fame. Himself to be the man the fates require, I firmly judge, and what I judge, desire. He said, and then on each bestowed a steed. Three hundred horses in high stables fed, stood ready, shining all, and smoothly dressed. Of these he chose the fairest and the best to mount the Trojan troop. At his command the steeds caparisoned with purple stand, with golden trappings glorious to behold, and champ betwixt their teeth the foaming gold. Then to his absent guest the king decreed a pair of coursers born of heavenly breed, who from their nostrils breathed ethereal fire, whom Circe stole from her celestial sire by substituting mares produced on earth, whose wombs conceived a more than mortal birth. These draw the chariot which Latinus sends, and the rich present to the 
prince commends. Sublime on stately steeds the Trojans born, to their expecting lord with peace return. But jealous Juno from Pachyna's height, as she from Argus took her airy flight, beheld with envious eyes this hateful sight. She saw the Trojan and his joyful train descend upon the shore, desert the main, design a town, and with unhoped success the ambassadors return with promised peace. Then, pierced with pain, she shook her haughty head, sighed from her inward soul, and thus she said, O oh, hated offspring of my Phrygian foes, O oh, fates of Troy, which Juno's fates oppose, could they not fall unpitied on the plain, but slain revive and taken scape again, when execrable Troy in ashes lay, through fires and swords and seas they forced their way, then vanquished Juno must in vain contend, her rage disarmed, her empire at an end, breathless and tired is all my fury spent, or does my glutted spleen at length relent, as if twere little from their town to chase, I, through the seas, pursued their exiled race, Engaged the heavens, opposed the stormy main, But billows roared and tempest raged in vain. What have my Scyllas and my Surtes done, When these they overpass, and those they shun? On Tiber's shores they land, secure of fate, Triumphant o'er the storms in Juno's hate. Mars could in mutual blood the centaurs bathe, and Jove himself gave way to Cynthia's wrath, who sent the tusky boar to Calydon. What great offence had either people done? But I, consort of the Thunderer, have waged a long and unsuccessful war, with various arts and arms in vain have toiled, and by a mortal man at length am foiled. If native power prevail not, shall I doubt to seek for needful succor from without? If Jove and heaven my just desires deny, hell shall the power of heaven and Jove supply. Grant that the fates have firmed by their decree the Trojan race to reign in Italy. At least I can defer the nuptial day, and with protracted wars the peace delay, with blood the dear alliance shall be bought in both the people near destruction brought. So shall the son-in-law and father join with ruin, war, and waste of either line. O oh, fatal maid, thy marriage is endowed with Phrygian, Latian, and Rutulian blood. Bellona leads thee to thy lover's hand. Another queen brings forth another brand. To burn with foreign fires another land. A second Paris, differing but in name, shall fire his country with a second flame. Thus, having said, she sinks beneath the ground with furious haste and shoots the Stygian sound to rouse Alecto from the infernal seat of her dire sisters and their dark retreat. This fury, fit for her intent, she chose, one who delights in wars and human woes, even Pluto hates his own misshapen race. Her sister furies fly her hideous face. So frightful are the forms the monster takes, so fierce the hissings of her speckled snakes. Her Juno finds, and thus inflames her spite. O oh, virgin daughter of eternal night, give me this once thy labor to sustain my right and execute my just disdain. Let not the Trojans, with a feigned pretense of proffered peace, delude the Latian prince. Expel from Italy that odious name, and let not Juno suffer in her fame. Tis thine to ruin realms, or turn a state betwixt the dearest friends to raise debate, and kindle kindred blood to mutual hate. Thy hand o'er towns the funeral torch displays, And forms a thousand ills ten thousand ways. Now shake out thy fruitful 
breast the seeds of envy, discord, and of cruel deeds. Confound the peace established, and prepare their souls to hatred, and their hands to war. Smeared as she was with black Gorgonian blood, the fury sprang above the Stygian flood, and on her wicker wings sublime through night, she to the Latian palace took her flight. There sought the queen's apartment, stood before the peaceful threshold, and besieged the door. Restless Amata lay, her swelling breast fired with disdain for Turnus dispossessed, and the new nuptials of the Trojan guest. From her black bloody locks the fury shakes her darling plague, the favorite of her snakes. With her full force she threw the poisonous dart and fixed it deep within Amata's heart, that thus envenomed she might kindle rage and sacrifice to strife her house-husband's age. Unseen, unfelt, the fiery serpent skims betwixt her linen and her naked limbs, his baleful breath inspiring as he glides. Now like a chain around her neck he rides, now like a fillet to her head repairs, and with his circling volumes folds her hairs. At first the silent venom slid with ease, and seized her cooler senses by degrees. Then, ere the infected mass was fired too far, in plaintive accents she began the war. And thus bespoke her husband. Shall, she said, a wandering prince enjoy Lavinia's bed? If nature plead not in a parent's heart, pity my tears, and pity her desert. I know, my dearest lord, the time will come. You in vain reverse your cruel doom. The faithless pirate soon will set to sea and bear the royal virgin far away. A guest like him, a Trojan guest before, in shoe of friendship, sought the Spartan shore in ravished Helen from her husband bore. Think on a king's inviolable word, and think on Turnus, her once plighted lord. To this false foreigner you give your throne, and wrong a friend, a kinsman, and a son. Resume your ancient care. And if the god your sire and you resolve on foreign blood, know all are foreign, in a larger sense, not born your subjects, or derived from hence. Then, if the line of Turnus you retrace, he springs from Inachus of Argive race. But when she saw her reasons idly spent, and could not move him from his fixed intent, she flew to rage. For now the snake possessed her vital parts, and poisoned all her breast. She raves, she runs with a distracted pace, and fills with horrid howls the public place. And as young striplings whip the top for sport on the smooth pavement of an empty court, the wooden engine flies and whirls about, admired with clamors of the beardless rout. They lash aloud, each other they provoke, and lend their little souls at every stroke. Thus fares the queen, and thus her fury blows amidst the crowd, and kindles as she goes. Nor yet content, she strains her malice more, and adds new ills to those contrived before. She flies the town, and mixing with a throng of madding matrons, bears the bride along, Wandering through the woods and wilds and devious ways, And with these arts the Trojan match delays. She feigned the rites of Bacchus, cried aloud, And to the buxom god the virgin vowed, E voi, o Bacchus, thus began the song, And e voi, answered all the female throng, O virgin, worthy thee alone, she cried, O oh, worthy thee alone, the crew replied. For thee she feeds her hair, she leads thy dance, And with thy winding ivy wreathes her lance, Like fury sees the rest, 
the progress known, all seek the mountains and forsake the town, all clad in skins of beasts, the javelin bear, give to the wanton winds their flowing hair, and shrieks and shoutings rend the suffering air. The queen herself, inspired with rage divine, shook high up above her head a flaming pine, then rolled her haggard eyes around the throng and sung on in Turnus' name the nuptial song. E, O ye Latian dames, if any here hold your unhappy queen Amata dear, if there be here, she said, who dare maintain my right, nor think the name of mother vain, unbind your fillets, loose your flowing hair in orgies, and nocturnal rites prepare. End of Book 7, Part 1 Book 7, Part 2 of The Aeneid The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Maro Translated by John Dryden Book 7 Juno Served by a Fury, Part 2 Amata's breast the fury thus invades And fires with rage amid the sylvan shades Then, when she found her venom spread so far the royal house embroiled in civil war. Raised on her dusky wings, she cleaves the skies, and seeks the palace where young Turnus lies. His town, as fame reports, was built of old by Danae, pregnant with almighty gold, who fled her father's rage, and, with a train of following Argives, through the stormy main, driven by the southern blasts, was fated here to reign. Twas Ardua once, now Ardea's name it bears, once a fair city, now consumed with years. Here in his lofty palace Turnus lay, betwixt the confines of the night and day, secure in sleep. The fury laid aside her looks and limbs, and with new methods tried the foulness of the infernal form to hide. Propped on a staff, she takes a trembling mien. Her face is furrowed, and her front obscene. Deep dented wrinkles on her cheek she draws. Sunk are her eyes, and toothless are her jaws. Her hoary hair with holy fillets bound. Her temples with an olive wreath are crowned. Old Calibi, who kept the sacred fane of Juno, now she seemed, and thus began, appearing in a dream to rouse the careless man. Shall Turnus then such endless toil sustain in fighting fields, and conquer towns in vain? Win for a Trojan head to wear the prize, usurp thy crown, enjoy thy victories? The bride and scepter which thy blood has bought the king transfers, and foreign heirs are sought. Go now, deluded man, and seek again new toils, new dangers, on the dusty plain. Repel the Tuscan foes, their city seize, protect the Latians in luxurious ease. This dream all-powerful Juno sins, I bear her mighty mandates, and her words you hear. Haste, arm your Ardeans, issue to the plain. With fate to friend, assault the Trojan train. Their thoughtless chiefs, their painted ships that lie in Tiber's mouth with fire and sword destroy. The Latian king, unless he shall submit, own his old promise and his new forget, let him in arms the power of Turnus prove, and learn to fear whom he disdains to love. For such is heaven's command. The youthful prince with scorn replied, and made this bold defense. You tell me, mother, what I knew before. The Phrygian fleet is landed on the shore. I neither fear nor will provoke the war. My fate is Juno's most peculiar care. But time has made you dote, and vainly tell of arms, imagined in your lonely cell. Go, be the temple and the gods your care, permit to men the thought of peace and war.
These haughty words Alecto's rage provoke, and frighted Turnus trembled as she spoke. Her eyes grow stiffened, and with sulphur burn, her hideous looks and hellish form return. Her curling snakes with hissings fill the place, and open all the furies of her face. Then, darting fire from her malignant eyes, she cast him backward as he strove to rise, and, lingering, sought to frame some new replies. High on her head she rears two twisted snakes, her chains she rattles and her whip she shakes, and, churning bloody foam, thus loudly speaks, Behold whom time has made to dote and tell of arms imagined in her lonely cell. Behold the fate's infernal minister, war, death, destruction, in my hand I bear. Thus having said, her smoldering torch impressed with her full force, she plunged into his breast. Aghast, he waked, and starting from his bed, cold sweat in clammy drops, his limbs o'erspread. Arms, arms, he cries, my sword and shield prepare. He breathes defiance, blood and mortal war. So, when with crackling flames a cauldron fries, the bubbling waters from the bottom rise. Above the brims they force their fiery way. Black vapors climb aloft and cloud the day. The peace polluted thus, a chosen band he first commissions to the Latian land in threatening embassy, then raised the rest to meet in arms the intruding Trojan guest, to force the foes from the Lavinian shore and Italy's endangered peace restore. Himself alone an equal match he boasts to fight the Phrygian and Ausonian hosts. The gods invoked the Rutuli prepare their arms and warn each other to the war. His beauty these, and those his blooming age, the rest his house and his own fame engage. While Turnus urges thus his enterprise, the Stygian fury to the Trojans flies, new frauds invents, and takes a steepy stand, which overlooks the vale with wide command where fair Ascanius and his youthful train with horns and hounds a hunting match ordain, and pitch their toils around the shady plain. The fury fires the pack, they snuff, they vent, and feed their hungry nostrils with the scent. Twas of a well-grown stag whose antlers rise high o'er his front, his beams invade the skies. From this light cause the infernal maid prepares the country churls to mischief, hate, and wars. The stately beast the two Tyridae bred, snatched from his dams, and the tame youngling fed. Their father Tyreus did his fodder bring, Tyreus, chief ranger to the Latian king. Their sister Sylvia cherished with her care the little wanton, and did wreaths prepare to hang his budding horns, with ribbons tied his tender neck, and combed his silken hide, and bathed his body. Patient of command in time he grew, and, growing used to hand, he waited at his master's board for food, then sought his salvage kindred in the wood, where grazing all the day, at night he came to his known lodgings and his country dame. This household beast that used the woodland grounds was viewed at first by the young hero's hounds as down the stream he swam to seek retreat in the cool waters and to quench his heat. Ascanius, young and eager of his game, soon bent his bow, uncertain in his aim. But the dire fiend the fatal arrow guides, which pierced his bowels through his panting sides. The bleeding creature issues from the floods, possessed with fear, and seeks his known abodes, his old familiar hearth and household gods. He falls, 
He fills the house with heavy groans, implores their pity, and his pain bemoans. Young Sylvia beats her breast and cries aloud for succor from the clownish neighborhood. The churls assemble, for the fiend who lay in the close woody covert urged their way. One with a brand yet burning from the flame, armed with a knotty club, another came. Whate'er they catch or find, without their care, their fury makes an instrument of war. Tyreus, the foster father of the beast, then clinched a hatchet in his horny fist, but held his hand from the descending stroke, and left his wedge within the cloven oak to whet their courage and their rage provoke. And now the goddess exercised in ill, who watched an hour to work her impious will, ascends the roof, and to her crooked horn, such as was then by Latian shepherds born, adds all her breath. The rocks and woods around, and mountains tremble at the infernal sound. The sacred lake of trivia from afar the veline fountains and the sulfurious gnar shake at the baleful blast the signal of the war. Young mothers wildly stare with fear possessed and strain their helpless infants to their breast. The clowns, a boisterous, rude, ungoverned crew with furious haste to the loud summons flew. The powers of Troy, then issuing on the plain with fresh recruits, their youthful chief sustain. Not theirs a raw and unexperienced train, but a firm body of embattled men. At first, while fortune favored neither side, the fight with clubs and burning brands was tried. But now, both parties reinforced, the fields are bright with flaming swords and brazen shields. A shining harvest either host displays, And shoots against the sun with equal rays. Thus when a black-browed gust begins to rise, White foam at first on the curled ocean fries. Then roars the main, the billows mount the skies, Till, by the fury of the storm full-blown, The muddy bottom o'er the clouds is thrown. First, Almond falls, old Tyreus, eldest care, pierced with an arrow from the distant war. Fixed in his throat the flying weapon stood and stopped his breath and drank his vital blood. Huge heaps of slain around the body rise. Among the rest the rich Galesus lies, a good old man, while peace he preached in vain amidst the madness of the unruly train. Five herds, five bleating flocks his pastures filled, his lands a hundred yoke of oxen tilled. Thus, while in equal scales their fortune stood, the fury bathed them in each other's blood. Then, having fixed the fight, exulting flies, and bears fulfilled her promise to the skies. To Juno thus she speaks, Behold, it is done. The blood already drawn, the war begun. The discord is complete, nor can they cease the dire debate, nor you command the peace. Now, since the Latian and the Trojan brood have tasted vengeance and the sweets of blood, speak, and my power shall add this office more. The neighboring nations of the Ausonian shore shall hear the dreadful rumor from afar of armed invasion and embrace the war. Then Juno thus. The grateful work is done, the seeds of discord sowed, the war begun. Frauds, fears, and fury have possessed the state and fixed the causes of a lasting hate. A bloody hymen shall the alliance join betwixt the Trojan and Ausonian line. But thou with speed to night and hell repair. For not the gods, nor angry Jove, will bear thy lawless wandering walks in upper air. Leave what remains to me, Saturnia said. The sullen fiend 
her sounding wings displayed. Unwilling left the light and sought the nether shade. In midst of Italy, well known to fame, there lies a lake, Amsanctus is the name. Below the lofty mounts, on either side thick forests, the forbidden entrance hide. Full in the center of the sacred wood, an arm arises of the Stygian flood, which, breaking from beneath with bellowing sound, whirls the black waves and rattling stones around. Here Pluto pants for breath from out his cell, and opens wide the grinning jaws of hell. To this infernal lake the fury flies. Here hides her hated head and frees the laboring skies. Saturnian Juno now with double care attends the fatal process of the war. The clowns returned from battle bear the slain implore the gods and to their king complain the corpse of almon and the rest are shown shrieks clamors murmurs fill the frighted town ambitious turnus in the press appears and aggravating crimes augments their fears proclaims his private injuries aloud a solemn promise made and disavowed a foreign son is sought, and a mixed mongrel brood. Then they, whose mothers, frantic with their fear, In woods and wilds the flags of Bacchus bear, And lead his dances with disheveled hair, Increase the clamor, and the war demand. Such was Amata's interest in the land. Against the public sanctions of the peace, Against all omens of their ill success, with fates averse, the rout in arms resort to force their monarch and insult the court. But, like a rock unmoved, a rock that braves the raging tempest and the rising waves, propped on himself he stands. His solid sides wash off the seaweeds and the sounding tides. So stood the pious prince, unmoved, and long sustained the madness of the noisy throng. But when he found that Juno's power prevailed, and all the methods of cool counsel failed, he calls the gods to witness their offense, disclaims the war, asserts his innocence. Hurried by fate, he cries, and borne before a furious wind, we have the faithful shore, Oh, more than mad men, you yourself shall bear the guilt of blood in sacrilegious war. Thou, Turnus, shalt atone it by thy fate, and pray to heaven for peace, but pray too late. For me, my stormy voyage, at an end, I to the port of death securely tend. The funeral pomp, which to your kings you pay, is all I want, and all you take away. He said no more, but, in his walls confined, shut out the woes which he too well divined, nor with the rising storm would vainly strive, but left the helm, and let the vessel drive. A solemn custom was observed of old, which Latium held, and now the Romans hold. Their standard, when in fighting fields they rear against the fierce Hyrcanians, or declare the Scythian, Indian, or Arabian war, or from the boasting Parthians would regain their eagles, lost in Carhai's bloody plain, two gates of steel, the name of Mars they bear, and still are worshipped with religious fear. Before his temple stand, the dire abode, in the feared issues of the furious god are fenced with brazen bolts. Without the gates the wary guardian Janus doubly waits. Then, when the sacred senate votes the wars, the Roman consul their decree declares, and in his robes the sounding gates unbars. The youth in military shouts arise, and the loud trumpets break the yielding skies. These rites, of old by sovereign princes used, 
were the king's office. But the king refused, deaf to their cries, nor would the gates unbar of sacred peace, or loose the imprisoned war, but hid his head, and, safe from loud alarms, abhorred the wicked ministry of arms. Then heaven's imperious queen shot down from high, at her approach the brazen hinges fly, the gates are forced, and every falling bar, and, like a tempest, issues out the war. The peaceful cities of Thousonian shore, lulled in their ease, and undisturbed before, are all on fire, and some with studious care their restive steeds in sandy plains prepare. Some their soft limbs in painful marches try, and war is all their wish, and arms the general cry. Part scour the rusty shields with seam, and part new grind the blunted axe, and point the dart. With joy they view the waving ensigns fly, and hear the trumpet's clangor pierce the sky. Five cities forge their arms, the Atenian powers, Antimni, Tiber with her lofty towers, Ardea the proud, the Crustumerian town. All these of old were places of renown, some hammer helmets for the fighting field, some twine young sallows to support the shield, the crosslet some, and some the quishes mold, with silver plated and with ductile gold. The rustic honors of the scythe and share give place to swords and plumes, the pride of war. Old falchions are new-tempered in the fires, the sounding trumpet every soul inspires. The word is given, with eager speed they lace the shining headpiece, and the shield embrace. The neighing steeds are to the chariot tied, the trusty weapon sits on every side. And now the mighty labor is begun, ye muses, open all your helicon. Sing you the chiefs that swayed the Ausonian land, their arms, and armies under their command. What warriors in our ancient clime were bred? What soldiers followed, and what heroes led? For well you know, and can record alone, What fame to future times conveys but darkly down. Mezentius first appeared upon the plain. Scorn sate upon his brows, and sour disdain, Defying earth and heaven. Etruria lost, he brings to Turnus' aid his baffled host. The charming Lausus, full of youthful fire, rode in the rank and next his sullen sire. To Turnus only second, in the grace of manly mien and features of the face. A skilful horseman, and a huntsman bred, with fates averse a thousand men he led. His sire unworthy of so brave a son, himself well worthy of a happier throne. Next, Aventinus drives his chariot round the Latian plains, with palms and laurels crowned. Proud of his steeds, he smokes along the field. His father's hydra fills his ample shield. A hundred serpents hiss about the brims. The son of Hercules, he justly seems, by his broad shoulders and gigantic limbs of heavenly part, and part of earthly blood, a mortal woman mixing with a god, for strong Alcides, after he had slain the triple Gerion, drove from conquered Spain his captive herds, and thence in triumph led on Tuscan Tiber's flowery banks they fed. Then on Mount Aventine the son of Jove, the priestess Rhea found and forced to love, for arms his men long piles and javelins bore, in poles with pointed steel their foes in battle gore. Like Hercules himself his son appears, in salvage pomp. A lion's head he wears, about his shoulders hangs the shaggy skin. The teeth and gaping jaws severely grin. Thus, like the god his father, homely dressed, he strides into the hall, a horrid guest. Then two twin brothers from the fair Tiber came, which from their brother Tiber's took the name. Fierce Chorus 
in Catillus, void of fear, armed Argive horse they led, and in the front appear. Like cloud-born centaurs, from the mountain's height with rapid course descending to the fight, they rush along, the rattling woods give way, the branches bend before their sweepy sway. Nor was Prynestes founder wanting there, whom fame reports the son of Mulciber, found in the fire and fostered in the plains, a shepherd, and a king at once he reigns, and leads to Turnus's aid his country swains. His own Prynesty sends a chosen band, with those who plough Saturnia's Gabine land, besides the succor which cold Aenean yields, the rocks of Hernicus and the dewy fields, Anania fat, and father Amasini, a numerous rout, but all of naked men, nor arms they wear, nor swords and bucklers wield, nor drive the chariot through the dusty field, but whirl from leathern slings huge balls of lead, and spoils of yellow wolves adorn their head, their left foot naked when they march to fight, but in a bull's raw hide they sheath their right. Messapus next, great Neptune was his sire, secure of steel and fated from the fire. In pomp appears and with his ardor warms a heartless train, unexercised in arms. The just Faliscans he to battle brings, and those who live where Lake Chimenea springs, and where Feronia's grove and temple stands, who till Fescinian are Flavinian lands. All these in order march, and marching sing the warlike actions of their sea-born king. Like a long team of snowy swans on high, which clap their wings and cleave the liquid sky, when homeward from their watery pastures borne, they sing, and Asia's lakes their notes return. Not one who heard their music from afar would think these troops an army trained to war, but flocks of fowl that, when the tempests roar, with their hoarse gabbling seek the silent shore. Then Clausus came, who led a numerous band of troops embodied from the Sabine land, and in himself alone an army brought, "'Twas he the noble Claudian race begot, "'the Claudian race, ordained in times to come "'to share the greatness of imperial Rome. "'He led the Curies forth of old renown, "'Mutuscans from their olive-bearing town, "'and all the Eritrean powers, "'besides a band that followed from Vilinum's dewy land, "'and Amaternian troops of mighty fame, "'and mountaineers that from Severus came and from the craggy cliffs of Tetrica, and those where yellow Tiber takes his way, and where Hymella's wanton waters play. Casperia sends her arms, and with those that lie by Faberis and fruitful Foruli. The warlike aids of Horta next appear, and the cold Nursians come to close the rear. Mixed with the natives born of Latine blood, whom Alia washes with her fatal flood, not thicker billows beat the Libyan main when pale Orion sets in wintry rain, nor thicker harvests on rich Hermus rise, nor Lycian fields when Phoebus burns the skies. Then stand these troops. Their bucklers ring around, their trampling turns the turf and shakes the solid ground. High in his chariot then Halesus came, a foe by birth to Troy's unhappy name, from Agamemnon born, to turn his aid, a thousand men the youthful hero led, who tilled the massic soil for wine renowned, and fierce Aruncans from their hilly ground, and those who live by Sidonesian shores, and where with Sholy fords Fulturnus roars, Cales and Oscar's old inhabitants, and rough Saticulans inured to wants, light demi lances from afar they throw fastened with leathern thongs to gall the foe. Short, crooked swords in closer fight they wear, and on their warding arm light bucklers bear. Nor, Oibalus, shalt thou be left unsung from nymph Semethus and old Telon sprung, who then in Teleboan Capri reigned, 
but that short isle the ambitious youth disdained. And o'er Campania stretched his ample sway, where swelling Sarnus seeks the Tyrene sea, or Batulum, and where Abella sees from her high towers the harvest of her trees. And these, as was the Teuton use of old, wield brazen swords and brazen bucklers hold, sling weighty stones when from afar they fight. Their casks are cork, a covering thick and light. Next these in rank the warlike Ufanes went, and led the mountain troops that Nursia sent. The rude Equicoli his rule obeyed, hunting their sport, and plundering was their trade. In arms they ploughed, to battle still prepared. Their soil was barren, and their hearts were hard. Umbro the priest, the proud Morubians led, by King Archippus sent to Turnus's aid, and peaceful olives crowned his hoary head. His wand and holy words, the viper's rage, envenomed wounds of serpents could assuage. He, when he pleased with powerful juice to steep their temples, shut their eyes in pleasing sleep. But vain were Marcian herbs and magic art to cure the wound given by the dart and dart. Yet his untimely fate, the Angetian woods, in sighs remurmured to the fusine floods. The son of famed Hippolytus was there, famed as his sire and as his mother fair, whom in Egerian groves Arisha bore, and nursed his youth along the marshy shore, where great Diana's peaceful altars flame in fruitful fields, and Virbius was his name. Hippolytus, as old records have said, was by his stepdam sought to share her bed, but when no female arts his mind could move, she turned to furious hate, her impious love. Torn by wild horses on the sandy shore, another's crimes the unhappy hunter bore, glutting his father's eyes with guiltless gore. But chaste Diana, who his death deplored, with Esculapian herbs his life restored. Then Jove, who saw from high with just disdain, the dead inspired with vital breath again, Struck to the center with his flaming dart, The unhappy founder of the godlike art. But Trivia kept in secret shades alone Her care, Hippolytus, to fate unknown, And called him Virbius in the Egerian grove, Where then he lived obscure but safe from Jove. For this from Trivia's temple and her wood Are coursers driven, who shed their master's blood, Affrighted by the monsters of the flood, his son, the second Virbius, yet retained his father's art and warrior steeds he reigned. Amid the troops, and like the leading god, high o'er the rest in arms, the graceful Turnus rode, a triple of plumes his crest adorned, on which with belching flames Chimaira burned. The more the kindled combat rises higher, the more with fury burns the blazing fire. Fair Io graced his shield. But Io now with horns exalted stands, And seems to low. A noble charge, Her keeper by her side, To watch her walks, His hundred eyes applied, And on the brims her sire, The watery god rolled from a silver urn His crystal flood. A cloud of foot succeeds, and fills the fields with swords and pointed spears and clattering shields of Argives and of old Sicanian bands and those who plough the rich Rutulian lands, Aurunkan youth, and those Sacrena yields. And the proud Labicans with painted shields and those who near Numitian streams reside and those whom Tiber's holy forests hide or Circe's hills from the mainland divide where Ufanes glides along the lowly lands, or the black water of Pomptina stands. Last, from the Volscians, fair Camilla came, and led her warlike troops, a warrior dame. Unbred to spinning, in the loom unskilled, she chose the nobler palace of the field. Mixed with the first, the fierce Virago fought, sustained the toils of arms, 
the danger sought. Outstripped the winds in speed upon the plain, flew o'er the fields, nor hurt the bearded grain. She swept the seas, and as she skimmed along, her flying feet unbathed on billows hung. Men, boys, and women, stupid with surprise, where e'er she passes, fix their wondering eyes. Longing they look, and gaping at the sight, devour her o'er and o'er with vast delight. Her purple habit sits with such a grace on her smooth shoulders, and so suits her face. Her head with ringlets of her hair is crowned, and in a golden call the curls are bound. She shakes her myrtle javelin, and behind her lishen quiver dances in the wind. End of Book 7